Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, Kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. Okay, so we've gone from really specific brain injury, both congenital and acquired, to kind of this bigger, broader kind of um, perspective. And this video kind of brings us to that big, broad picture of what are all the different things that we have to think about by way of development or impact on development. Um, and just a couple of seconds that we're going to spend on stress, and then we're going to give you guys a break, and then we'll come back. So. Um, so as far as stress, what we know is it does affect, and you saw on that original slide, uh, trauma was on there. Trauma is stress, obviously. And stress in the brain, we know, um, responds chemically. And a chemical called cortisol is, re is released, and cortisol can reset a baseline if there's too much of it. So what we know is also it, affi it affects the ability to focus, think, learn, all of those things. So if we have a higher level of cortisol or an inability to regulate the cortisol and, and really get back to baseline after a traumatic incident or 
an emergency or something, then it might reset that baseline. So we're dealing with a, a heightened state, so to speak. So it is an important thing to realize when we talk about stress and the importance of uh, building those positive coping strategies. What we also know is that good and bad is an important developmental thing. It is important to learn coping strategies around those stressful times and supporting kids through that so that they come out on the other end with some perhaps some strategies to employ next time they're stressed. But also we know that there's lots and lots of different things and, um, and layers, if you will, to considerations. There's cultural implication layers. There's all kinds of um, things to think about when we think about response to a stressful situation or emergency or crisis uh, as far as young children go and its effect on the brain. So when you think about this bad to or toxic stress and you look at that perceived threat, we've all heard of flight or fight, right? And our, um, our brain's response to that is to go to a really primitive level of functioning. All of the extraneous higher order thinking is out the window, and we're really looking around survival, right? And, and that's the only thing that we can comprehend. So we respond accordingly. But when you look at self-centered, no ability for empathy, do we know kids that kind of function like this? Granted, we are in a developmental stage a lot through all of our childhood. And so typical development is same as, you know, uh, the, we're trying to figure that out, where they are with typical development. But when you put stress on top of it, and we have kids responding in a really self-centered way or not a, no ability to empathize or to even show levels of empathy at all, we're quick to judge. We're quick to label. We're quick to go down that road of inability kind of a thing, and we need to treat that in a certain way. And our framework that we're going to get into right after the break, hopefully we'll change that paradigm a little bit from kind of a behavior or a choice to a skill deficit. And we're going to be looking at skills to, that drive those kinds of responses for kids. All right, we are getting into the meat. If, we, if we've been hitting on the vegetables and the potatoes all morning. But this is the meat. All right, welcome back. So the framework that we are leaving you with today hopefully will, over, will be an overlay for you in looking at all kids. All right, and this is our learning that we've taken from the brain uh, development, typical brain development world, and made it our own here in Colorado. Uh, but it does, it is based on neuropsych um, and brain development science. So we look at the hierarchy of neurocognitive development. And that's a big way, fancy way of saying brain development, right? And it is hierarchical. So when we think about brain, like overall functioning, and what we want to be able to um, strive for as educators, for every single one of our students, we're looking at this top purple area, cognitive ability and overall functioning, right? But what that assumes is that our brains are clicking 100%. And all of these areas or domain areas are solidly in place. All right, so when we, Think about how our brains, your brain, my brain, child's brain develops. There's a hierarchy to it, or a layering, or a foundational uh, kind of piece that is absolutely imperative. And that is this fundamental processes layer down here with attention, inhibition, processing speed, memory, and sensory motor. All of those are foundational domains or, or developmental areas in our brain that lend itself and are attributed to and are impacted by and are involved in every single thing 
that builds on top of that. So the next layer is learning, language, and visual spatial. So that's the next layer that gets put on top and that accesses and utilizes all of these foundational domain areas to get further down that road. So when we think about that frontal lobe slide that Karen talked about and the different developmental kinds of um, maturation rates, that's what we're looking at this higher order level, executive functions and social emotional competency. So when we think about all executive functions and our ability to emotionally regulate and socially respond and all of those things, that's really higher order thinking. That's involving our frontal lobe. So unless all of these lower level or foundational domain areas are solidly in place, are we going to have a really good or typical kind of way to access even uh, access the executive function areas and be able to plan and be able to organize and be able to uh, initiate a task and all of those things. So this is what we talk about when we talk about the brain development and the skills that are absolutely necessary for kids to learn, to develop language, to socially respond. So when we look at the, this kind of big picture all of these things are absolutely important to work together in concert to get to that ultimate cognitive functioning, overall functioning, being able to do life skills, being able to put all of the reading and comprehension and summarizing and everything academically together uh, in a way that is comprehensive. All right? So hopefully, when we think about these various layers, we think a little bit differently about what we need to do as educators to identify gaps and fill those gaps in and provide a, a teaching um, way of filling those gaps in. So here are the original or foundational domains, attention, inhibition, processing, speed, memory, sensory, motor. The change that some of you who uh, attended our level two training uh, there's a change in here. We added or pulled out, so to speak, inhibition. Inhibition is an actual part of um, our brains in the, in the area of attention. Attention and inhibition are closely related. And we had lumped inhibition under attention. But inhibition, the ability to stop an impulse, is so absolutely integral to learning and behavior, right, for all of our kids that we thought, you know what, we need to pull that out and really specifically hit on that um, separately. So that is a change um, from our original training on this. So the next layers we have, it's all color-coded, is green, and it's the new learning and all the language, receptive, expressive, and social pragmatic, uh, as well as visual spatial. And then we have this higher order thinking. The executive functioning skills that we've pulled out in Colorado to really highlight, it depends on who, which researcher or which article you read as to uh, the executive functions that they list. These are the ones that we list, uh, that we really focus in on as far as the five areas that we um, kind of categorized as uh, really important ones to, to um, talk about by way of learning and behavior. Initiation, so being able to start a task, reasoning, planning, mental flexibility, and organization. So those are the five executive functions that we've pulled out. Again, depending on who you're reading or what, you're, what uh, uh, resource you're looking at, you might see working memory in there. Memory is such a, a foundational one that we wanted to keep that at that bottom level, at that foundational level. You might see um, social-emotional, in there, we've pulled that out as separate because it's a very, very important one, and we have a whole chapter dedicated to it in this manual. So this manual is the brain injury development or the brain injury in children and youth manual for educators. It's basically our guidelines for brain injury in Colorado. It's um, 
80 pages chock full of great information. All of this information is in here and then some. It's a great tool. It's a free download off of the CDE website. And um, it's helpful for educators. It's helpful for parents. It's helpful for everybody, all kinds of providers. So definitely download it um, from the website. And maybe, just maybe, we're going to give one away later on. So, um, so it's a great resource. And again, goes into way a lot of detail um, when it comes to this framework and this um, information. And by the way, I know Karen said, we're not going to go into special education criteria for traumatic brain injury because we don't have time and that's a whole other different day of training. But in learning this hierarchy, you have just learned the criteria for the traumatic brain injury special education category in Colorado. Yay! <laughs> Weave it together. How about that connect? Yeah. So when we talk about this, and, and we know that the traumatic brain injury special education criteria is just that. You can only go with it at traumatic. These are all the same learnings, all the same domains that you would want to do assessment in, want to do um, educational planning around for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, for non-traumatic brain injury, for trauma, for fill in the blank, ADHD, right? So broad learning as well as a really specific uh, application to this as well. And we know that this is a group with lots and lots and lots of not only energy because now we've worked off that drive in, <laughs> but um, knowledge and expertise. So you guys are going to teach each other about the specifics of these domain areas at your table. So we're going to do a jigsaw. You each have an envelope with all of the domains in here. You've got a definition on one side and a few strategies uh, to get at that domain area on the other side. What I'd like you to do is put it in order. So we're looking at fundamentals, the orange, green is the intermediate, and blue is higher order thinking. Put those in order, divvy them up, and teach each other these definitions of each domain. As you're teaching, you can flip it over and share one or two is all of the strategies on the back. Or if you have a strategy that you employ, share that with your table. All right, we're going to give you about 12 minutes for this, so it's not, it's not very much time, so let's move quickly. Now, we are all experts on every single one of these domain areas, right? All right, so obviously we, we're going to spend a little bit more time on these, uh, and we're going to get into many, many more um, specifics around intervention and the applicability of all of these areas. Um, but thank you for doing the jigsaw and teaching one another and learning yourselves about each of these areas. So just to, um, overall, again, when we look at truly this hierarchy and, and think about it as a hierarchy and that building, we could have kids with really, really wobbly foundations, right, that we're trying to work at, work with. And they might be showing up with some really odd behaviors or difficult behaviors to deal with. If, in fact, we stay only focused on the higher order or on that behavior. And we can do all the, the best FBAs, functional behavioral assessments that we are trained on in school. And <laughs> we can do all of the most beautiful writing of behavior intervention plans. And we're still not working. It might just be that there's gaps down here that we need to address first. So let's go into these a little bit. So we'll start with the fundamental. And again, it's all color coordinated um, in this manual. And I stayed away from the RTI colors <laughs> so that we don't, don't have that. I you know, tried, to, tried to stay away from those. So it really is a, a separate thing. But so attention. Attention and uh, the ability to uh, focus on the right stuff at the right time is an absolute, we, we think about, what do we think about with regards to attention or deficits? And attention. ADHD, thank you. 
Um, yes, yeah, so ADHD is definitely one that we see many, many, many of our kids um, have the diagnosis of ADHD, right? Regardless of what other else is going on. Um, but absolutely an important piece of brain function by way of learning and behavior. And this represents all learning and all behavior, right? So what we also know is if, in fact, we are working with uh, someone who has sustained a brain injury. Brain injury, if you've got a diagnosis of ADHD, what's the typical treatment for ADHD? Med stimulants, right? Even more specifically. So stimulants introduced into a brain that's injured, that's already functioning in a different way, can be lots and lots of atypical responses, <laughs> right? So not a benign diagnosis when we're talking about students with, who have sustained a brain injury. So th think about that when we've got co-occurring kinds of things or um, di multiple diagnoses. Inhibition. Again, we pulled this out because it was um, an absolute uh, integral to learning and behavior. The ability to stop an impulse. The ability to not blurt out. The ability to hold back physically and not jump right in or smack someone or I don't know my space from your space so I'm just ramrodding through because um, I can't stop myself. I don't even think about being able to stop myself. Memory. Um, memory is um, definitely something and it, another thing to, th to think about by way of this hierarchy is how we work, how closely we need to work with all of our colleagues. Each and every one of us on that multidisciplinary team brings something to the table with regards to understanding these different domains and understanding them through the lens of speech-language pathology or school psychology or social work or OT, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things lend itself to a multidisciplinary approach because we all bring something to the table that can add to that picture. So highly... Um, collaborative process we're suggesting. So memory is absolutely uh, a key area and very, very sensitive to brain injury. Um, each and every one of these fundamental domains are very sensitive to brain injury. So um, could be impacted, will be impacted at least for a few minutes if you get a bump on the head to uh, longer term uh, impact across the years. Working memory. Uh, is, is one of those areas that you might see categorized as an executive function. And working memory is part of that brain that we're hanging on to some level of information, adding something to it, and manipulating the, the thing to spit something else back out. Very, very important in the learning process. And processing speed. Processing speed, again, it's fundamental. It's a, a very uh, sensitive one. We see lots and lots of kids that are like two-minute responders in a 10-second world, right? And we just move on. And they are so lost, and, so, and they are, there's no way that they can keep up because their brain is just not being able to keep up. When we think about it in regards to brain injury, there might be a rerouting. Our brains are amazing. And they can actually rework those connections around a damaged area but what does that take? It takes time, right? It would take more time for that workaround in the actual brain functioning area, and so processing speed is impacted. And when we just move on, and kids are lost, and kids need to save face, and then we see behavior, and then we see, you know, it's just kind of that whole uh, thing unfolding. And the last one in the fundamental level is sensory motor. Sensory motor is... Um, it's, it's kind of a big area, right? All clumped together, and I look at my PTs and my OTs in the room, and, and we, we use that expertise a lot to figure out how to best support a student in a classroom that has sensory integration needs or sensory uh, overload um, needs. And, and what do we think about with regards to sensory? Like what, what kind of diagnosis or um, disability category do we think of mostly? Autism, thank you. And we have lots of ways 
of working with kids on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum, around this. But no, sensory and, and motor issues are absolutely uh, a part of the brain injury world, a, a part of uh, trauma, neglect, ADHD, all of those things. So much, much bigger than just the autism spectrum disorder uh, world that we can borrow from, so to speak, our interventions and apply those. This is a really short video that highlights our friend Sheldon from Big Bang around sensory. So when you say you're not going to freak out about the DVD, here's what that means. <laughs> Don't fixate on it. Don't wake me up in the middle of the night or nag me through the door while I'm on the toilet. <laughs> Okay, first, talking to you while you're on the toilet isn't exactly a picnic for me either. <laughs> yeah, remember, when you can hear me, I can hear you. <laughs> and second, you completely disregard how uncomfortable unresolved issues are for me. It's, it's like a, an itch in my brain I can't scratch. When I broke my arm, I used to stick a coat hanger down there. <laughs> Never try that, maybe go in through the ear. <laughs> You wouldn't make jokes if you could feel the way I feel. Yeah, well, I don't know how to do that. How about this? I promise I won't pester you about the DVD. You can defecate in peace. <laughs> That's a win for both of us. But <laughs> until this matter is resolved, I would like you to wear this sweater. <laughs> with nothing underneath it. That's stupid. Why? You say it's itchy and uncomfortable. I say situations like this make me feel the same way. I'm telling you, try the hanger. <laughs> Put it on. Let's share the experience. You got it. If this sweater shuts you up, I'm going to make a fortune selling them to everyone we know. <laughs> now, all I need to do is head down to the video store and return the DVD. <laughs> oh, did I forget to tell you? That store went out of business years ago. <laughs> really? <laughs> How those nipples feeling, Chief? Sheldon is always a good one to learn from, right? With regards to quirkiness and things to think about. But, but imagine an itch in your brain that you just can't scratch. How much would you be able to focus on the math problems in front of you or the reading passage that you, were just listen, that you just listened to? Serious. I mean, I, we, we, don't, we don't think about these things sometimes as educators as critically as perhaps we uh, should. So. so on to the next level, intermediate processes. We have all learning. So when we're talking about brain injury, this is, you know, after that certain, that typical development, however many months or, eight or years that we're talking about of typical development, and then a brain injury happens, it could be all new learning from that point forward. New learning and concepts and trying to tie that back to background learning and all of those things could be affected. When we're talking about the congenital world, I learn differently. So you heard in the Eight Magic Keys video, we need to try differently rather than harder. When you, t when you speak louder to a person who's hearing impaired, doesn't really work, right, if they're deaf. So if you can, you can do lots and lots of things, um, more and more of the same doesn't work. We have to think differently and think of it from different angles and, and have different tools in our tool bags perhaps to pull out. Visual, spatial where I am in consideration with the world around me, visual spatial of visual uh, graphs, charts, lining up a math problem, being able to um, write in a certain way, being able to draw out certain um, things in, the, in a way that makes sense, all of those would be attached to that visual spatial process in our brain. Very, very much could be um, affected. Also being able to um, 
just control where I am in consideration of everyone else. And when we think about a secondary school hallway, it's pretty chaotic, right? It can be a very unpredictable, loud, jostling, physically challenging uh, thing to navigate. And if I'm having issues visually or spatially with all of that and trying to navigate with that on top of it, I'm going to have some real difficulties. Language processing. Receptive, expressive, and social pragmatic. We see a lot of um, differences or unevenness, and we'll talk about the hallmarks of brain injury or um, effects of brain development um, with regards to this. But we might see differences in, even within this. Expressive, they might be pretty higher functioning or average um, and, and look just like their peers, but receptively be totally different. So those could be very different in that look, and we need to drill down and make sure that we're doing what we need to do by way of assessment so that we get that picture exactly of how they're functioning. And never, ever, ever leave out social pragmatic. Uh, for those SLPs in the room, um, are you guys using the metacognitive self five? Where are my SLPs? Do you guys have the self five? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing head nods, thank you. Um, uh, there's a whole uh, segment now of the new uh, assessment in this area for social pragmatic and for executive function. And now on to the higher order. So only until we know the status of all of those domain areas that we've just covered should we go here. Now we might have to go here simultaneously because if we've got behavior, we've got to talk about social emotional competency, right? And skill building within that but it might be weaving in those lower domains uh, at the same time. We do know that this one's a huge one. Regulation is within that, all of those things. When we um, um, address that, it truly is a full chapter in this manual because it is a big, big area. And then we have our five areas of executive function. So reasoning, able to reason out data, compare, contrast, all of those things. Mental flexibility, also another domain area that we see um, uh, issues in the, in, with the autism spectrum disorder, being able to shift between task, shift between environment, shift between um, classrooms, that kind of a thing. And a big one. It's a really big one. If we are mentally inflexible, we're, we're going to be derailed really, really easily. So anything you put in front of that learner after that derailment, you could, it could be a moot point. You're, you're not getting anywhere, right? Planning, the ability to set a goal, sequence steps to get there, and actually act on those steps. Organization, this is around thoughts, activities, materials, um, and my environment. How am I organizing my space around me and my thoughts or my thinking process to lend itself to meeting a goal or to acting on those uh, sequencing of steps, et cetera, et cetera. And initiation. Initiation is one that I don't think we talk about enough. Um, we see kids spacing off, playing with something, looking out the window, whatever. Yeah, that could be that they're just disengaged, they're not focused, there could be lots of different things going on. But it also could be that process in the brain that actually helps us initiate movement toward a task or beginning a task could be affected. So it really could be I am having an inability. I don't even have the ability because I'm not able to access that process in my brain to start what you're asking me to start. So when we think about it in that way and a skill deficit way, we could be talking about a totally different approach, right? We have queuing systems. We have physical prompts, we have whatever the case may be, but if it's an initiation issue, we might be handling it much different than a, uh, I'm not focused, I'm spacing off, all of those kinds of things. So, so we definitely need to do our due diligence. Of course, as educators, we are all striving for this, for this upper level ability to pull all of these things together, all of the domains are acting in concert well. There's no gaps in there, um, or we've filled it, done our job to fill in those gaps with some strategies or compensatory skills. Um, 
to where all of this comes together. And as an adult or um, uh, an adolescent even, I'm able to do all of these things in my world in a way that makes sense. And, of course, it's all about academic achievement, too. I'm able to learn. I'm able to summarize. I'm able to comprehend. I'm able to all of the academic things come into play, too, and pull from or draw from each and every one of those domain areas. Mm -hmm.